Are you ready? Are we ready? All right, welcome to the 1040 talk um, on testing OpenShift on OpenShift. Take it away. Yep. So, hello guys. Uh, my name is Samvaran Kashyap Ralabandi and I go by name SK and uh, I work for continuous productization team. And I have been working on a project called the CI Pipeline, which is a part of uh, CentOS Pass SIG community. And today, today we are, uh, in, in the current talk, we are going to discuss about the following things, like uh, uh, we, we are going to test OpenShift on OpenShift, like a uh, use case, and how, we, how is it feasible for us, and how, how, how did we really, like, work on it? And uh, why do we need OpenShift on OpenShift? And the, and the basic terminology we need to understand, like the whole whole process, like the containers, libvirt, and OpenShift. Again, containers. Ah, oh, that's repeated. Uh, and about the privileged containers and what are the differences between them? And uh, like, why do we need OpenShift on multiple clouds? And uh, how 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 are we deploying OpenShift on multiple clouds? And how how, we, how is the whole process is enabled by a tool called as Linchpin? And uh, we'll have a short introduction about like CI pipeline project, and we'll have a demo, and we'll be concluding the whole presentation there. Going ahead, um, like the our use case now is to like um, install and run end-to-end -end tests of OpenShift on a VM which is running inside an OpenShift container. So it's like we are running a nested virtualization scenario where, where we are running a virtual machine inside a container uh, which is already running on an OpenShift VM. And why do we need it? Like uh, because of the regular system updates, uh, uh, we we found a need to test OpenShift on like multiple distros. Like for example, CentOS and Fedora. Like uh, Fedora is going very going very fast. Like uh, we have Fedora 26, 27, 28, and 29 is in B. Maybe it is in beta. And every time, like whenever there is an update, uh, there there is a need like whether the OpenShift works on that update or not. So like uh, that, that, that is the thing which we are going to address. Uh, and, and, why, and we also need to check out like, uh, why, like, how, how the OpenShift works with the multiple deployments, and why does it fail, and how does it fail in, in multiple distros also. So in, in that case, like, we need OpenShift. Uh, we need to test OpenShift in a very feasible manner uh, using OpenShift itself. So uh, before we go ahead with the talk, like these are the things which you uh, need to know about, like uh, containers. Like most of the uh, people uh, who are attending this, this talk should be knowing about the containers. Like containers are nothing but an isolated user spaces, like uh, which acts as a processes running uh, a shared kernel, uh, which uh, which can simulate your work and like environment, like uh, uh, Fedora servers. Or like the CentOS servers in a, in a use, uh, isolated user spaces, and we have like privileged containers. Uh, these are like the containers which uh, uh, which gain the access to the host kernel, and we'll be discussing more about that. And OpenShift is a container management platform uh, which uh, uh, which is based on Kubernetes distribution, which recently changed its name to OKD, uh, Origin Kubernetes Distribution. So I should be using that term more, uh, like by promoting that uh, instead of like uh, taking OpenShift name. And the finally, like uh, we will will be. The, uh, we should also be knowing about the uh, libvirt daemons where like uh, libvirt is an open source api uh, which is uh, used for managing different kinds of virtualization platforms and which have uh, like uh, different kinds of virtualization uh, hypervisors like uh, zen hypervisor or kvm etc going ahead uh, let's let's talk about like uh, a container versus a privileged container so when you, when you talk about a container like uh, it is just a process, or it is just a command running inside a user space. Um, well, then why do we need uh, 
why do we need a privileged container in place? Because like some, like most of the times, uh, containers are kind of secured uh, by a, uh, containers are secured by a container engine, which are, which run on top of an operating system, uh, which is kind of using like uh, the kernel and the, which and it is and it is running on an infrastructure. However, like uh, in in case of privileged containers. The uh, containers kind of bypass this container engine and get access to the operating system and the kernel devices directly, which uh, we might or might not want to do, like in certain cases, because uh, uh, unless uh, unless the container is uh, uh, unless the container needs to use the devices shared by the kernel, uh, we shouldn't be using privileged containers uh, because there, there is a risk where like container can run commands like rm minus r slash and uh, like uh, remove the host all, all at once, so which we don't want it to happen. Uh, I have a perfect analogy for this, like uh, where uh, have you guys used like hotels and Airbnbs? You definitely have used. So what do you think about, about like Airbnb? So is it uh, is it secure enough, or like uh, which which one do you prefer? We're staying in a hotel or like staying in an Airbnb? Hotel? Yeah, if if my company is kind of sponsoring me, like uh, to stay in like a hotel, then I would definitely prefer hotel. But in some cases, uh, like uh, in case of Airbnb, um, you kind of share the share the resources like kitchen and like the sometimes the washrooms. I have pretty worst experience with with Airbnb and great experiences too. So uh, Airbnb kind of acts as a privileged container, like uh, a person who is using Airbnb. Can uh, like uh, can be a like well mannered person and uh, make use of the whole like uh, accommodation very in a very good way, or he can destroy the house. He can set your house on your house on fire. So that's what happens with the privileged containers. Like uh, if you are not being careful with the privileged containers, uh, the whole whole uh, infrastructure is on fire. Like uh, people might uh, delete the devices, or uh, it can it can go like uh, in in an error state. Whereas in in in, in terms of uh, in when we check out the hotels these are like the secured spaces which have the security mechanisms like um, security mechanisms of like security guards or like patrolling around and they are they have access to the cops at any point of time and each room is kind of uh, uh, on its own which which doesn't share the resources and hotels are like uh, have the best service also uh, because like uh, hotel management is kind of responsible for maintaining the rooms uh, whereas in kind of in terms of Airbnb, the whole like uh, the guests are kind of uh, morally oblig obligated to clean up their rooms like when they go away. Uh, but in hotels, it's not the case. So going ahead, uh, why do we need uh, OpenShift on multiple clouds? So uh, recently, like uh, we have seen OpenShift popping up on every type of cloud provider, like OpenShift on AWS, uh, OpenShift on Azure, uh, we're in collaboration with Red Hat, and OpenShift on like uh, Google Cloud Platform. So there, there, there can be like many scenarios like which you want to use. Uh, so there, uh, even like you, you would like to run OpenShift on your local machine to, uh, for your development environment. So, but there must be a better way to choose cloud providers. Like there, there must be like an easier way to, uh, for your deployments to happen. So advantages would be like uh, you can choose what you want to like uh, when you choose multiple cloud providers. Uh, in some cases, like uh, Amazon is like more costlier. Like uh, uh, it's just an example. It might not be true in real time scenarios. Uh, Amazon might be more costlier in terms of storage. Uh, Google cut down its cost like every uh, every three months to compete with Amazon. So I might want to uh, run my OpenShift deployments on Google Cloud. Maybe like uh, Amazon is more efficient. efficient in terms of storage, so I want to keep the storage on Amazon, uh, but uh, I would like to run my machines on Google Cloud. So I want to connect them together. Uh, like uh, that, that is like very difficult these days because uh, each cloud provider has its own API, and it's very difficult to connect them. And the person who is using those APIs like should have intense domain knowledge of like both the cloud providers at any point of time. And uh, like uh, when we uh, when we kind of deploy the whole, whole infrastructure on multi-cloud basis, uh, I, I'm I'm pretty sure that like uh, a Google Cloud on Amazon like uh, both wouldn't be down like uh, at the same time like uh, the. 
So there will be less downtimes and there might be less latencies like according to the regions which they actually offer. Wouldn't it be dreamy like uh, if we have a lightweight tool that does the whole like multi-cloud uh, platform deployments? So there we get the tool called as Lynchman. So Lynchman is a collection of Ansible playbooks, modules, and like uh, simple Python scripts, uh, which enable this cross-cloud deployments and multi-cloud deployments. Going ahead, like uh, Lynchman does have its own terminology, like uh, which you need to understand before we use Lynchman. Uh, Lynchman has workspaces where workspaces are nothing but a collection of files which are generated to manage your cloud deployments. Or oh, it's not difficult to like uh, create a workspace. It's just a simple command called as Lynchman in it, and it just uh, creates your workspace magically. And we have a pin file, where, which is the starting point, entry point for Lynchpin to grab details from. And they have uh, topologies and layouts. Each topology constitutes of different resource definitions of like multiple clouds, which we'll be seeing in the uh, upcoming slides. And uh, we, have, we have layouts to generate uh, multi-cloud inventories uh, automatically based on, based on the data which we fetch from the different cloud providers. And the best part of Lynchpin uh, is the hooks. So hooks are uh, something which you uh, which acts as like a pre-provision and the post-provision scenario like based scripts which you can run, uh, which can enable like uh, things like OpenShift installations. Going ahead, this is the Lynchpin flow. Like a uh, Lynchpin, uh, if, if you see Lynchpin as a black box and it takes topology and layout as an input and it gives you an output file, and it gives you an Ansible inventory if there is a layout, and it connects to all the cloud providers uh, like AWS, OpenStack, GC, and there are like six to seven providers like which we support right now uh, through Lynchpin, and it provisions the instances. So the, all the outputs will be uh, gathered from the APIs provided by the cloud providers. And Lynchpin, is, uh, Lynchpin hooks works on the like, generated inventories. So they run uh, Ansible playbooks, Python scripts, or like uh, um, Node.js scripts, Ruby scripts on the generated inventories once the pro like, resources are up and running. And they create a deployment using some magic. Uh, there, there, is no ma there is no magic in between, but uh, it does use Ansible, so which we call it as magic because that is a pretty good tool which uses SSH which I always like wonder like uh, how, how come SSH can be an integral part of deployments. So that, that's, that's what I feel so magic. So we use Ansible in between to deploy the inventories. And going ahead, this, this is a, a typical workspace how it looks like. Um, uh, it works with, this is a workspace to install MySQL on a particular topology. And uh, it cons consists of the credentials where, which are stored in like YAML. Uh, we can use like uh, whatever credentials which you want. And uh, these three credentials, which are uh, standardized credentials of like OpenStack, AWS, and the Google Cloud. Uh, and we also have hooks. We created an Ansible hook in, in this particular case, uh, which installs a D DB server uh, from, from an external role. And after that, like uh, we have fold different types of folders uh, to uh, to store different kinds of files like inventories, layouts, topologies, and uh, resources and topologies. And this is how a pin file looks like. And uh, each pin file ha is a, a collection of key value pairs where you just give the reference to the topology and layout. Uh, in our case, like uh, we can we can use uh, any other uh, we can use a layout for like OpenShift uh, three node cluster or like a four node cluster that cr that creates a Ansible inventory for for us to create uh, Ansible inventory to deploy the whole whole OpenShift environment. And these are the examples of the topologies, which consists of uh, resource groups, def resource definitions, and there can be like n number of definitions coming up. 
So the highest deployment which I have made is level is about like which I accidentally made uh, using Linchpin uh, was like a 20 node deployment on my AWS account, uh, which uh, which costed me like a $200 over two days. <laughs> that that was crazy. But uh, I I came to know about a lesson like uh, okay you should be very careful with the count attribute of this inventories, uh, count attribute of this uh, topologies, and Linchpin works with bigger deployments too. Though we haven't tested in the production environments of deploying 20 node clusters, but it does provision like 20 node clusters. Uh, this is the basic structure of uh, Linchpin topology where we have resource groups and it consists of like different resource definitions and each resource group can have its own metadata which can be parsed. And the best part of this topologies are like they do support Jinja templating where you can dynamically render the whole template templates of topologies so that like there can be an ad hoc provisioning like uh, di different other provisioning tools. And this is the inventory layout, which is uh, kind of uh, cloud agnostic in nature because uh, it doesn't specify, uh, it doesn't tell you to choose from the which cloud provider. It intelligently like uh, goes to the uh, provision instances and brings out the like uh, brings out the uh, resources based on the count attribute there. To map the Ansible example layout with inventory, like uh, we have uh, three sections mainly. Like uh, one section is the wars, which translates roughly to the all wars inside the Ansible inventory. And at the same time, like each host has its own host group, uh, which consists of its own metadata using the layouts. Going ahead, uh, this would be a successfully generated inventory for like uh, an app server and DB server. Uh, as you can see, uh, there can be like um, there there can be a uh, AWS instance and a Google Cloud instance working together, or there can be a um, private cloud private cloud instance to which you can connect them together. As long as the network permits you to do that. And coming with the linchpin hooks, which which are kind of part of uh, our like use case of uh, testing OpenShift on OpenShift, uh, in the linchpin hooks are like kind of context-aware uh, scripts which run after the lin after the provisioning of the instances happen. Uh, there can be like uh, five types of hooks. It can be written in Ansible, Python, Shell, Ruby, and Node.js too. And there are like four states where you can initiate hook on, um, where one is the pre-up state, that is, which is before the provisioning has happening, is happening, and one is the post-up, post-up, which is after the provisioning has happened, and the one is before the pre, uh, before the destruction. If you want to do some cleanups uh, to the external cloud providers, if it's your own custom scripts, which you can do, and one is with the post destroy, which can be helpful in a case where uh, if you want to assure or like uh, be certain of the, whether the resources are being uh, destroyed properly or not. And this is an example hook of uh, in installing a DB server. Uh, uh, basically, we, we don't do like uh, much work in creating hooks because if we use uh, if we use a playbook uh, which uses a, a, an existing role, this would be a playbook looks like. It's just referring to a role which is externally available on Ansible Galaxy. So you need not write different types of roles if they are already on the Galaxy. And this is a, like a quick while, Linchpin 101 of uh, like how Linchpin is installed and how do we uh, create instances. Um, you, uh, you install it via PyPy and after that you create a workspace uh, using Linchpin in it. And giving, up, giving to the credentials path, uh, you, can, um, you can use Linchpin up command just like you do with Vagrant up. Uh, it creates all the instances and if layout is specified, it creates the Ansible inventory too. And finally, if you want to destroy the inventories, uh, or you, it won't destroy the inventory, but it would destroy the whole resources out there uh, by using linchpin destroy command. And finally, to make uh, OpenShift on OpenShift possible, like uh, we used a container uh, which is specifically uh, which specifically uh, installs linchpin and other dependencies. And which also runs, uh, which also runs libvd inside the container. So uh, we kind of borrowed this uh, Docker file from uh, Mr. Like uh, Brenton Bard. Um, 
uh, this is like one of the uh, great examples which we found uh, in order to run libvirt inside um, inside a container. And on top of it, we like uh, we just uh, had to install some of the dependencies uh, like the libvirt developer uh, devil and the RPM builds and the bash completions which are necessary for uh, which are necessary for creating like libvirt instances. And uh, what we did is like we kind of uh, since uh, we are using like uh, privileged containers, oh, uh, are almost there. Like uh, since we are using privileged containers, uh, we we were like trying to run the whole libvirt daemon by uh, overriding the existing setup uh, with um, uh, the host machine's KVM device, and. We got to the point where we kind of created an inception inside an inception. Uh, we, like we create, we had a miniature VM. On top of it, we are running a Linchpin container. On top of it, like uh, we are running OpenShift Origin, and we are using Linchpin to run end-to-end -end tests. So this is a simple like uh, uh, workspace. Uh, I would like to sh show the. I would like to show the, how the workspace looks like. You can access this work, workspace uh, on onto this particular repository. And uh, before before I conclude and show the demo, like I would like to talk more about like our CI pipeline project, uh, where the, the the whole testing OpenShift on OpenShift is a part of CI pipeline project, where we are trying to like accommodate uh, an automation framework uh, which uses different types of containers and tools to make your CI process easier. And uh, in an example project, uh, which uh, testing OpenShift on OpenShift is a part of as a stage. Where we were testing, we, are, we were actually getting the packages of Atom Fedora Atomic Host, and every commit that is made to the Fedora Atomic Host runs through the pipeline, and um, uh, it triggers a build package and runs the functional tests and composes an OS tree. And further, the, there will be integration tests made on the compose of the images, and finally. Like once the image is being generated, that uh, image is being fed to the Linchpin libvirt container, where the OpenShift cluster is being uh, booted inside the container, and end-to-end uh, -end tests are being run. So this is how our pipeline looks like. Um, as I said, it go like whenever there is a disk git um, commit, it goes through all the stages. And uh, finally, like uh, it, it confirms like the, this is the part uh, which where the linchpin works inside a container to run the OpenShift test. Oh, oh, oh sorry. <laughs> uh, coming back to the demo. I hope I can play this. Oh. So this is an OpenShift open environment um, which is ru running locally, and we have the Linchpin libvirt containers, uh, which are already being built as a part of the CI pipeline process. And this is our Jenkins environment where the, our actual pipeline runs. I, I, for this particular demo, I kind of isolated all the other stages and used the Linchpin libvirt container directly uh, to run our OpenShift end-to-end -end tests. In this case, uh, it started provisioning the instances and uh, in, in using a libvirt provider. So uh, the, uh, using a quick work through, this is a privileged container which uses the host machine's uh, libvirt de, uh, daemon, and, but the virtual machine is actually running inside the container where it uses uh, Linchpin hooks to install the OpenShift and run end-to-end -end tests on it. So it, it took like uh, 28 minutes, uh, 38 minutes last time, and uh, it's going to take like uh, a little while more. Uh, but the whole demo is like uh, is within two minutes. So I edited the demo. I took a freedom to edit the de demo, and uh, now it's kind of d downloading the image source from that. Uh, that that would be a Fedora Atomic image, and it uses Linchpin to um, boot that image and run OpenShift tests on it. Let me just forward it a little. Now it's generating the outputs, and it is generating the OpenShift inventory with a hook, which would be the post inventory, uh, post provisioning hook.
and it started uh, installing the OpenShift environment on, on to the virtual machine. And once the open shift uh, single the, in in this current experiment, like uh, we we try to run the single node environment because uh, running like a full blown open shift deployment inside a container, uh, which we tried it, uh, <laughs> kind of crashed our environment like uh, like uh, multiple times. So we uh, just wanted to check only the single node environments. So coming back to the presentation. <laughs> I thank for uh, I thank my uh, whole team, like continuous productization team, uh, for all the like support they have given me and for giving an opportunity to work with this particular project. And feel free to feel free to uh, fork the uh, fork the repository of CI pipeline. We are looking for contributors. And uh, on Freenode, we are continuous infra, and we have a mailing list for like continuous infra at redhat.com. If you have any doubts, so. Any questions? Yeah, sure. Uh, what's the performance like in terms of uh, comparing Linchpin to like just using a Ansible playbook that has uh, that uses like the AWS modules or the OS modules for OpenStack? In terms oh, of the, um, performance like uh, since we are like underlying uh, so underlying uh, playbooks of Linchpin actually uses OS server uh, and um, other things like if you are just uh, talking about the provisioning of instances, uh, it's hardly it hardly differs in milliseconds because um, the things which we do is like the, uh, it is just instantiated by Ansible API. Uh, and the Ansible API calls the playbooks where the OpenStack server, like uh, OpenStack server modules are, um, Ansible OpenStack modules are referred. So it shouldn't be any any much of a difference. But when you talk about the like a whole run from uh, creating of instance to uh, generation of inventory, which you need like multiple playbooks to run, uh, and still then like uh, Linchpin gets an advantage on top of it by simplifying the process rather than on performance. So we, in Linchpin, we have multiple components called as RunDB, where we use a database to store uh, the existing topologies and uh, uh, successful runs. And you can repeat it again and again like uh, based on a transaction ID. So essentially, it, uh, it, it can be a, like a, uh, thinking about that, it can act as an external cloud service provider. Uh, if we write a REST wrapper around it, it can be a uh, full-blown uh, like provisioning as a service kind of thing. But currently, it's just a small lightweight tool which does provisioning across multiple clouds. Any more questions? No. Uh, have you played with uh, Kubert instead of like manually? Not yet, uh, but uh, some part of my like a uh, couple of people in my team they have st they have started working with Kubert, uh, and I heard like um, pretty cool stuff with Kubert. So we are going to like uh, we are going to like implement Kubert soon. Okay. So. Any other questions? Right, all set. Okay, thank you. So, like, uh, like uh, one more small announcement. Like, uh, I have a talk about like CI pipeline for dummies, uh, which is which could have been better. Like, if I gave that talk first, because that <laughs> that has like all the basics of like how the pipeline works and uh, uh, how OpenShift works and water containers, and it starts from a basic level where. Uh, what is the software and how does it work? So, so like, uh, feel free to attend that. Like, uh, and that's it. So, thank you.